if you're embarking on a big project, putting a team together is really a smart exercise because a good architect, a good contractor, a good QS is going to save you money. Business of Architecture UK, episode 64. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and this week we've got a fantastic interview with Rachel Laxer, the founder and principal of Rachel Laxer Interiors, and with Beth Clancy, who is the senior design director uh, working alongside Rachel at Rachel Laxer Interiors. So the studio itself, Rachel Laxer, um, is a luxury in interior design studio based in London and New York and they focus a lot on high-end luxury residential homes, hospitality and a lot of corporate spaces and I was very lucky as you know uh, if you listen to this podcast that I enjoy when my guests invite me to a project of theirs and this week I got to sit inside uh, Rachel's beautiful home in St. John's Wood and it was a really fascinating conversation as Rachel and Beth talked about how they collaborate together how they work, how they understand and deliver on uh, a client's vision, and also the sort of fiscal discipline behind delivering a project on time and on budget. And it was quite interesting. Rachel has a previous uh, earlier career chapter on Wall Street where she was working, uh, trading for Salman Brothers, Steinhardt Partners, and the Soros Quantum Fund. Um, So this is a really interesting interview uh, where we're talking to some interior designers so there's a lot of overlaps about how to work how architects and interior designers can work together I think that's a very important conversation the art of collaboration and the learnings that we can gain from looking at other design disciplines so sit back relax and enjoy Rachel Laxer and Beth Clancy Special announcement here, we at the Business of Architecture UK love to help you win more great clients and projects and we've got a really cool opportunity for you. Our affiliate colleagues over at the Architects Marketing Institute would like to offer you a very special 45 minute one-on-one breakthrough call with one of their senior marketing experts. Now, the Architects Marketing Institute, which was co-founded by my good friends, Eric Bobro, Richard Petrie, and also Enix Sears was one of the original founding members. So these guys really are some of the world's leading marketeers for architects. So you're going to be in very, very good hands. And on this call, the Architects Marketing Institute, or AMI, will help you map out a simple action plan. And this is going to be based on their experience of working with hundreds of architects around the world, where they've helped them increase their income and the quality of their projects. And it's going to be tailored to you, depending on your budget and your goals, and of course, your ability to be able to implement. So the Architects Marketing Institute, just like us at the Business of Architecture UK, absolutely adore and love helping architects and want to help you attract more and win better opportunities for your practice. So that is the one-on-one session with AMI Architects Marketing Institute. It's a free session, but in order to be able to qualify to have one of these sessions, there are a few required criteria. And the first one of those is that you are the owner, partner, or main decision maker for an architecture practice or design-related business. You must be able to have the ability to provide exceptional service and results for your clients. And finally, you must be targeting at least a further £100,000 in additional revenue for your practice. So if that sounds like you and you want to speak to one of the Architects Marketing Institute senior advisors, jump on one of those breakthrough session phone calls, click on the link that's provided in the information and AMI will be very happy to speak with you. And then after your successes, you can come and tell me all about it on the Business of Architecture UK. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me on the Business of Architecture. Thank you for having us. Absolute for having us. pleasure <laughs> to come to your beautiful abode and uh, experience a bit of your design work. Um, so tell me a little bit about your practice, when you started. Um, when I started. It was a, uh, design has been a second career. So I started after my youngest daughter was born, and she's now 14, so it's been about 12 years. And I started working out. I was very fortunate to get an internship with Kelly Hoppin a long time ago, and then it turned into um, 
working in the studio and doing sourcing and then a bit of work for her back in America. And we went back there for a couple of years. And then when I came back, um, I joined an architectural firm and started with Rachel Laxer Interiors. And were you based here originally or were you in the US to, to begin with? I was, I worked for Kelly here. Right. And then we moved back to America and I had never thought about setting up my own business, but the way it was working with her and me being in the States, I had to set it up. And I used to, we, I used to do small projects under my name and big ones under her name um, with her. And then when I moved back, um, my girls were young and I didn't really want to be in an office full time. And I knew I wanted to do something. So I set up uh, working on smaller projects here and I did it uh, from my house which is where it is still. And then what were those smaller kinds of projects and how did you win those? Um, how did you differentiate between the ones that had to be under her and the ones that you did by yourself? Um, we picked a monetary amount. And drew oh, okay, a line, and you did and it by drew, that. And we drew a line in the sand. And so anything that was a complicated big project... Um, was, it, was that for insurance reasons? or what kind of It was a little bit for insurance and a little bit because I had no confidence at the time to start doing things on my own and she was wonderful because she really encouraged me to take on board these small projects and I remember the very first one I did was just someone's was taking over a porch room and turning it into a family room and I had to fit this sofa in there and I think I must have measured that one it was a Minotti sofa and I measured it maybe a hundred times. Because <laughs> I was so <laughs> Making <sure> worried <laughs> that I was going to measure it wrong. Like I taped it out and I measured it. And I, you know, I didn't work in CAD. Everything was drawn by hand. And I was just measuring and measuring. And they, they must have wondered why I had to come back so many times <laughs> to measure that one sofa. But it's funny when I look back on that project because I, it's, this is why photographing your work is so important because mm. it gives you context and reference for what you've done, it still, the room still holds up. Like I would still put that Minotti sofa in and we had done B and B chairs and it's still a great family room. And when did you and Beth begin working with each other? Um, about four years ago. Mm. Yeah. And how did that relationship begin? Um, it's sort of funny. I, we met long, long, a uh, long time ago. And you interviewed me a long, long time ago. I interviewed her. And then... When I was sort of fresh out of KLC and I was a textiles designer before I was an interior designer. And you interviewed me then, but you were back and forth to the States a lot more then. Yep. And it did, just didn't work out. And then I went off and worked for another designer. And it wasn't till four years, five years after that. But I, I really liked Beth. I thought, she's got a really great mind. And I would call you up and be like, let's go for a drink. So yeah, I wanted, we kept in contact. And, and then we had, I had a party. I invited you for a party. And I kept thinking, this is a really smart person. Mm. And then the, the person who was working with me left. And I called you up and I said, well, can you leave now? Like, are you ready to, like, make a move now? And you had been with a, an amazing firm. And who's yeah, a, a, like and a still very phenomenal designer and it was sort of like right time in your life I yeah, think to make a change exactly and I, I'd been there quite a long time and it made sense to leave yeah so that's and I think rest is history and I also <laughs> think that things happen at the time they should happen yeah like I think our relationship is so much better now than if you had come when you oh, were and first I think I didn't know half as much so I think I was a much better a much better designer when we came into contact Yes. The Com second time, Matt, being so much more confident and everything. Works so, what, so many more. So what would you say is the other things that make your relationship, your working relationship work? Because <laughs> that's, that's always, you know, I'm, I'm assuming you were operating kind of by yourself for, well, how were you operating previously? Were you working with freelancers or how did you structure your office? Well, previously I had, a long time ago, I had a partner who moved back to Canada. Right. And... I really enjoyed... She was a project manager, wasn't she? Yeah, she, mo she mostly did project yeah. management, and I mostly did design. I mean, that's sort of where we drew the line. And then she moved back, and then I, at that point, just had 
sort of more assistance and I kind of did everything. And I really missed the dialogue because I, I, I firmly believe like because it's a creative process, one plus one is not two. It's always three, four, five. You get a lot more out of just open conversation. And I think when Beth became available, it was very clear that she wasn't coming on board just to be a project manager or just to be a design. Like it was definitely to be a collaborative force and it was a design partnership. Mm. Um, I don't think at the time we thought it would go. I think it what it's gone. It's really and, grown in a and been more successful maybe than yeah yeah. And you never know, right? You never know when you first start. Is it going to be what I think it's going to be? And hopefully you get lucky and it all kind yeah. of yeah. So how, so how how do you how have you gone about growing your business? How do you go about winning winning work? We do a lot of stuff on Instagram, and we're lucky enough that we have a lot of repeat business right so Rachel has done projects for people say eight years ago and now we're on their fourth house um so they repeat you know come back again and again yeah which is and they refer lovely. and they refer and they refer yeah and their friends and, and do, you, do you have like a system in pros for getting referrals like do you ask them or is it just it just happens naturally it sort of happens naturally yeah. but I do I always think um I think, or I worry, I think, like, all right, where, how, how, what's the next one mm. coming along? But so far, we've been pretty lucky that things kind of come. And we've been lucky with the way it's spread out states to UK. We've had a lot, like when I first started, we did a lot more in the states. And now the last couple of years, we've done a good bit more in the UK. And then maybe next year will be more states. And I think also I love doing... Um, and then we did something in spec, you know, you we've know, had nice sort of European we've had, stuff. We've had a nice mix between commercial yeah. and residential lately, which is yeah. great. Because um, beforehand we were more sort of residential and then we did an uh, office and then that we did a hotel and now we're doing another office. So how's that been as a change? What, what, what are the differences that you're finding working for private clients now to working on commercial clients? Because that, in some aspects, that can be a very difficult transition to make. What have you found of the obstacles and what have you found have been have worked really well? Um, well, the plus, I think, to commercial is you show up, you have a meeting, you present, you put a plan together, you put a budget together. If the budget's approved, you proceed. Where sometimes... It's not one, it's not per, one person's personal... People are um, less invested. People, yeah, it's not like this is my living room. So people are... People are like, this is my office or this is a hotel and we are a group of people making decisions. So people are less invested. personally invested. Yeah. Right. There's, it's is that a good or a bad thing? I think it's great. I think it's, you know, it's very different doing someone's office and that is a public space to doing someone's bedroom or someone's child's room or, you know, these are very... Um, intimate spaces, right? So it's just a whole different way of thinking about things. I think the difference on commercial is um, the decision-making process can take, it's slow in a different way. Like you have to... Selecting the item isn't slow, it's the process that's slow. It's the paperwork and yeah. processing and the 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 billing department. And, and like, then you have to go through the QS and the QS has to get it signed <laughs> off by someone else and someone has to come back and sign that off every single invoice so you can't whereas the joy of maybe being with a private client is that you can walk through the marche or pousse in paris find a bunch of amazing things yes. and just go right i'll take that and i'll take that and, and i'll pay mm. for it and you're done right you know so, so, yeah. how, so how does how does that impact or how do you have to mitigate your design process then for the slowing down of decisions you have to keep reminding your vendors that you really are going to buy these pieces <laughs> and could they please continue to keep them on hold and um, <laughs> and I think lots of that comes down to having good good supplier relationships mm. so people if you have someone that you use a lot you're able to say we are going to place this order please keep a space in the queue for us please remember us before <laughs> you put that other massive hotel through because that's always the problem with, I think, a commercial project. You have a, a pretty hard deadline of when you have to deliver it. But their billing process 
can eat into your delivery time. And that's and the it, production time. Because right. especially we did a hotel and we use lots of very small makers. So you're asking one man to make you 50 bedside tables. Mm. He's not going to make them that's at night. So there's a, there's a kind of a complexity with the scale that you're now yeah. working at in terms of being able to deliver things. So what, what do you mean by the billing process? How is that constraining or what's the, what are the differences? Because this is, this is quite an interesting topic. I mean, I know... I think with a private client, they're very happy for us to hold funds on, on reserve and sort of use it as a drawdown for purchases. Right. Whereas a commercial project has a board of directors and shareholders and they're not going to just say, here's, a, here's some money, hold it and draw it down. So they want to pay, sort of buy the purchase, or they might be in a situation that they have that's someone... for insurance and ownability and lots of other, much more complicated that. Right. And they might want to do the purchasing themselves, yeah. and we have to then check the orders. So the purchasing, the, the actual purchasing process is very different on a commercial project. The one thing that I... Think that we've spoken quite a bit about is um, the hotel we did in Spain is small, and I once you do something small, the scalability we could have we could easily jump from twenty to two hundred now. I yeah. think because you get it, you get how you scale up yeah. for something like that. So or any other big hotels, they should call us immediately. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, how did you go about getting those first commercial projects? And how long, how long in your sort of career has it taken to, to, to move into from private residential into the commercial world? Because this can be, it's, it's rare for this to happen quickly, generally. Well, you, it's referral, Rachel. You've got it's a, all it's, referrals. She did someone's home and then right. their referral was for then into a, a, a commercial office space. So what happened was they, I did their home and... Um, not for the hotel actually but that's, no for the that's, hotel yeah. but the for the the commercial that I did the home the clients were very pleased the husband said to the wife will you do my office the wife called me and said I don't want to do his office could you do his office I said <laughs> sure <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do it and that one office then turned into all the offices mm. and then they liked it so much, they asked us, would we do the next big one? And yes. that's very much how things have flo um, flowed for us, very organically that way. Have you ever kind of had a vision of like, I want to have this type of project for these types of clients and then gone after it? Or has it been much more of an organic growth in the business? Mm, a little bit, I think we've gone after stuff. And I, and, and I think we'll probably continue go after more now that we got this under our belt because I really did because now you feel like you've done you feel like you've done a sort of a bit of everything well I also think we have to do a restaurant actually it would be great to, do a, great to do a restaurant I would love to do yeah. a restaurant because actually then you feel like hotel, restaurant, office, house <laughs> we would love <laughs> yeah. it and it was also nice when we did the hotel we did a spa we, and, yeah, we did we did, the dining and then we did the dining room inside that So, but actually the spa in particular was really interesting I loved doing the spa loved it the, um, the stuff you don't normally get to do. Mm -hmm. And it's intellectually interesting to have to research new topics. Yeah. Right? Um, well, how, how does it change when you're working on commercial projects? I mean, it's interesting. How, how do you work with other consultants? How do you work with engineers and architects? And you usually have a weekly site meeting where yeah. everyone sits together and then... And that's the, be that's the best way as well, a weekly right. site meeting. Where for you any project. For everybody, then everyone feels, the QS, you, the architect, everyone feels in the loop. And how, how, do, you, how do you start the process working with architects and engineers? What's the best way that you've found of creating good, solid teams that can move it's forward? It's different, this is, isn't it? Because sometimes a client has an architect right, and so they have a designer and then they bring the two of you together. It, it, right, it, it's really driven off the client. So for the commercial project, we were brought in as the designer, but they already had yes. their lighting person, they had their QS, they had their, their architect. architect. So they had their contractor, Every, everyone was sort of in place, and then you meet in a conference room. Um, and to Beth's point, this is the importance of weekly meetings, no matter how big or small your project is. And 
minutes, minutes, minutes. Everything has to be <laughs> minutes. minutes. <laughs> because then it, it creates accountability. Yeah. Everyone knows what they need to do. Also, it's a list for everyone then to work off, I always think. So then you yourself can go back to the minutes. Well, the nice thing, don't you remember in Spain, the architect would carry, he'd have the minutes. He, everything he needed to action, he would highlight. highlight like, yeah. And then he, he really worked from the minutes. And use them as a checklist. And in we the hotel we did was in was in Spain, so there was a whole language barrier as well. Even though our architects spoke very good English, and they the minutes were great to keep referring back to because they were something able to be put into Google Translate. Everyone was able to work from them like that. It was terrific. That was. <laughs> I keep thinking about how the painter and the electrician were hanging. That center light, or paint, painting, painting at the same painting time, painting over scaffolding, like because we had to get it ready. <laughs> yeah, and like you were saying, the, with the hotel, there was no, there's no movable date. That was the date it was opening. So when we were on site that last week, so that that also changes the flavor of a commercial project where the deadlines yeah. are. Because you just push, you you would say to a client, you shouldn't move in with all your lovely new things because it's not ready not yet. ready yet yeah so we, there have been a few things it's fallen behind whatever in a commercial project they're not in they're not interested just make in it that. happen yeah just make my deadline because we've got to move out of where else we're coming from yeah so it's there is no other place to go and how do you how do you then go about sort of protecting yourselves and your your designs when you're working to those sorts of deadlines Minutes. and then design <laughs> and changes are being made and the minutes, because we can say in the minutes, and we say quite frequently, if you do not order this by this day now, then right, okay, so we cannot yeah. deliver when we need to, to deliver. Yeah. And um, being really strict about saying, we're not paying for this for you. No, you know, we're not a bank. We're a small company. We will work till the, you know, we will get down and scrub the floor if we have to, to make it beautiful for you. But you have your responsibility to pay your invoices if you want this to happen. Yeah. And, um, and then I would say that's sort of on the commercial side is making sure that, you know, that wheel keeps moving. And on the residential side, I would say the biggest cog in the wheel would be a client not sticking to the critical path, not really listening to the, the contractor say, you have to check your chimneys first and clean your chimneys and check your lot. Don't try to clean your chimneys at the end of the project when I'm painting yeah, and all yeah, that yeah. fine dust is going to fly. Yeah, yeah. Because um, then you're going to have to repaint and then it's going to cost you twice as much. And... Um, Critical paths are there for reasons, you know, there, there is a, 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 and you have to make decisions when they're required. And if you do change them, um, I think the client has to realize change orders cost money yeah. and time. And how do you, how do you go about sort of negotiating your fees and, and kind of bringing all the, there's a lot of designers and architects that I end up speaking to. I mean, there's a big problem in the industry of people getting we, paid. We speak, yeah, we people, speak about this a lot. People getting paid late. And this, this happens all over the place. How do you protect yourself against that kind of event happening? And how do you work with it when it does happen? Because these are the type of things, for, particularly for a small business, it can really, fl- you know, it can really be... We try and really, we do try and really keep, keep on top of our accounts. And we have a wonderful bookkeeper. I also um, think... And if anything, chasing... It happens he we're, we're quite I really feel like we're quite on it with that and I also think that big change meaning really big meaningful change where we got caught out in the past yeah was we switched to Estimac which we is, used to use an American program we used an American a different program a different program this is an accounting program yeah and it's like a it's not it's, it's like a interior design management slash accounting program yeah right okay and it really is very clear about how much you have on an account yeah. and how much working capital, how much free capital you have. And it's always very dangerous at the end of the project because you want to buy this and buy this and buy Especially this. Especially little accessories, things that add up. And you've got to keep 
that reserve capital because we had, I mean, we, we've gotten burned where we've rushed, 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 bought something. Someone didn't have enough money, we assume, because they had paid a lot as the project was going on. They'd be good for the money at the end. And then they're kind of, well, you've made a lot and walk away, which is a very stinging yeah. lesson. Yeah. To, you know, remind yourself, you're as a small business, you're not Amex. You can't. Or visa, you can't. Leave. And I think we used to, we used to be like, well, don't worry, we'll just. We'll sort it out. I, I think we've got much better. I've been like, I'm really sorry. And Rachel will say to me now, like, how much has X got left? And when we get to a certain point now with like funds in hands, we're like, right, we either stop now and ask for more. So then it gives us that buffer before, because you you don't want to get down to. Less. 10 pounds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't because there's always something you need at and the very end. a FedEx or a courier or some billing, some shipping that you didn't account for. Account for. Well, how, how, do, how do you have the very sort of straight, frank conversations with your clients about what their budget actually is? Because this is something that happens a lot where a client will say they've got X amount and then things start happening. And we do a cost plan. At the beginning. Um, at the beginning, which is quite really quite detailed we do sort of each room every item of furniture cost what that amount including VAT including and you work with a quantity surveyor to produce that or you guys do that no, yourself no we do it we in do, half yeah. and we really we take a PC if we don't know something we'll take a good guess and take a PC sum so at least it has a number yeah. and then as they decide on things we you populate can, right and you can you can flag it up for early exactly early and, as and that's what we do Do we quite often if something's a hot, a big ticket we might highlight it, especially if we know maybe the build cost has cost more than expected. We'll be like, that marble in the bar is a pricey item if we could maybe change it out for something and, else. And then the other thing that we do do that I think is important for designers is do not forget in your cost plan to put 10 to 15% yeah. down for shipping. And contingent, we, we always do a contingency and line. contingency because there is there is there is always stuff. Yeah. So if the client's budget, let's say, is I don't know three hundred thousand, we like to have a fifty grand contingency or third forty grand because, and the client will say, "Well, why do I need this?" And we'll say, "It's a long road." You, if you have this, first of all, shipping is always way more than you think. And we always try to consolidate it and go with groupage, but you always there's always something that's there's always late one rug or... that's stuck in India that has to get on the plane, you know. <laughs> and then you have to airship, and then <laughs> it's know? really expensive. And if you have that cushion built in, there are no surprises. And then what happens is at the end of the project, you can say to the client, "We thought we needed the full contingency. We have." 10 or a little bit to give back and that always makes someone feel nice at the end of the project because yeah, there's nothing like getting something back they feel like they've spent all this money and the the other thing feels that, like value it feels like yeah, yeah. and the, the other thing we were talking about the other day we were just in a really lovely high-end italian furniture show when we went to check something out for a client and we do that quite frequently. We will go together and actually sit in the, sit in the stuff, and sit in the chair and check the wire management. So we were in this shop and there was a couple buying some things and we thought, why are they not using an interior designer? You know, if you're making the value you bring, like, and the, we get such good discounts and <laughs> so, so, so no, your fee would be it was already offset you'd, you'd make back the money you'd spend on an interior I know you, you get about 30% Just, off the you know exactly when you, and in this particular um, shop we were in the discount was, is great they wouldn't even need to buy a couple of sofas and you'd be right you'd have your money back mm. and, and I think that's where people don't recognise the value that if you know, we run a very open book. It's very fair. We have a design. And I think fee. it's really clear as well. You know exactly what it costs, and you know what our fee is, and it's and you know the discounts you're getting. You know, yeah. And we've gone through exercises with clients at the end, where we show them on the cost plan what the retail would have cost them, what our trade would have cost them, and they're essentially getting us 
almost for you know for and the no- money you'd save yeah and what that right, tallies okay. up to um so if you're embarking on a big project putting a team together is really a smart exercise because a good architect, a good contractor, a good QS is going to save you money and get and you a better... And add value everywhere, I think. Mm. Add value everywhere. Think well, that, that's, that's really interesting, actually, to you know, go up front almost and sort of start demonstrating to your potential clients, here is where, you know, here's previous projects that we've done, here's how much money we saved them, just in, just in terms of trade, mm-hmm. just in terms of being able to purchasing, plus the value of, you know, the design and the total finish of it. And this is something that lots of designers don't do or not comfortable with is, you know, talking about the financial aspects or the, you know, the commercial parts of how that they are bringing, you know, a fiscal discipline to, to a certain design project. And that can mean then you end up leading into conversations where the clients are kind of, they don't see what the value is or they kind of... That's why I think the, the, the way we do it is the best. To be truly open yeah. is, I think, the best, the best sort of... Well, I can't imagine do doing it in a different way because and then I also lots of people do no I know lots of people do but I just it feels like I think it's by being open it sells the service yeah and if a client ever wanted to see a supplier invoice we're more than happy to share all of that that, because there is there's transparency nothing hidden yeah yeah and the the other thing that I was noting is that we're working on something recently where the client wanted to do certain rooms herself and she wanted help with other rooms. And so I sort of a hybrid pro- project. And I always take it a stance that I don't think projects are too, too small. I like to take them as long as I like the person, I find it interesting. Um, I think we should do it because you never know where things lead or who, who's friends with who. And a powder room can turn into a whole house. Exactly. Exactly. And so she did this, one space upstairs herself thinking oh, I'll just use us for the lower level and I walked up there and I was like wow the scale is so off like the lights are too big and too low and this one thing is too big and another thing is too small and I thought it was a, a real shame she didn't just but that's because she hadn't seen well the, the beauty of seeing drawings drawings Drawing, we work with drawing. We always start with a, you know... Nice plan. Right. We have, we sort of have like a series of building blocks as we go along. And as Beth said, we have our cost plan, which is key. Yeah. Then we do layouts, like furniture layouts, mood boards. And we always go this, we always go plan until things are decided and then we go into elevation. Because there's no point to spending all the time on elevations until you know what it is you've selected. So on the mood board, we have multiple options at multiple price points. So you can really dial up or dial down okay. where you want to be. And if someone says to me, oh, I, we were just doing something and we loved a particular chandelier and it's, it's quite expensive. And I said, oh, should we leave it? And then we talked about it and we said, you know what, let's just leave it. Because if they like it, but they don't want to spend that for that item we can go down that route we can go source something similar maybe not by that artist but maybe more high street or more mainstream that accomplishes that idea yeah um and many times with the mood boards we could put it was we were talking about it we, we did a series of side tables for one seating area and we were saying, we like to guess, like, which one do we think? And if it were your house. If it were your house. <laughs> which one would you pick? Which would you, we played this game. <laughs> like, if it were your house, which one would you choose? And we both, and I said, you know, I love every single one of these side tables so much. I would just populate, I would use them throughout, throughout the, house. the house. I just all of them, yeah. I'd use them all. <laughs> just in different places. Like, they're so good. Um, and so I think that's the nice, th- and then once the client's, selected then it goes into elevations and then we like to also do cgis for people okay which they are we think they are the best tool yeah because i suppose with with drawings you you forget the clients they struggle with drawings and i think they're difficult to imagine you can't see 
everything from a drawing. CGI's are amazing. The quality now, you can really show someone exactly what <laughs> they're going to get. We have one client now who keeps referring it to it as the photograph, and we're like, I know. it's not a photograph. <laughs> it's it's gonna, CGI. It's a CGI. It's going to get really close, but it is not a, like this only Bring existed. Back that photograph. <laughs> it's only existed in our mind, and then we, but. Um, and it's also great for the builders to put the CGI up so they know what they're working. Did you know I even noticed that he, where, where we were this morning? Do you notice he had our CGIs pinned oh, up around the bathroom? Always. The whole time. Well, it, it's, it's amazing because one... And a, that was the scene. Tyler because the Tyler wanted to look at what we'd shown the client so he could stick to that. Yeah. Which I mean, is wonderful. It, and, it, and it's amazing because it is the most easily digestible form oh. of graphical communication. Like a drawing is complex and it takes, you know, even if you're an architect or interior designer, you've got to get into the drawing. Mm. Whereas a CGI is just immediate. And it's yet, very clear. And we used to do it that a CGI was an optional purchase with the, when you signed on for the service. Like additional. And now we don't. It's if included. You're, if you're hiring us this is part of the package yeah you can order more cgis but you you for your primary main spaces for yeah. what yeah for the primary rooms you have to have a cgi yeah because it also and that was you know you sort of live and learn with every project one of the hardest projects i ever did which was the most painful taught me some of the biggest lessons and it went on for too long and the client asked for too many choices and she didn't want to pay for the cgi and it would have been, never did any cgi no and i would have been better off doing a cgi because then she would have seen her choices felt confident mm. in them and and had a real vision of what it she, she, she found it very difficult she couldn't to visualize what that side table was going to look like in that space so we ended up Going around so many around. times, and I think if I had had the CGI mm. with multiple views, it would have made. I think it would have changed the whole energy of the project. Yeah. So uh, how, how do you how do you know when to say no to a client? Then <laughs> it's it's hard. <laughs> we talked about this downstairs. And do, and do you ever? Um, we're getting better at it. It's. Look, this is a people pleasing business, and it's a service. And it's a, ser it's a service, so I think there's. So it's difficult to say. No is very no. hard. <laughs> but we've talked. We talked about this in advance. Number one is. I don't think we've ever said no, but we, it, it's about putting limitations. Saying this on, is this is what this we is can the timeline, this and is, this is what we can, and this is the line in the sand. This is what we can do. Yeah. We and this is the limit. We recently had a client and. They kept negotiating, and, and finally we said, you know what, this this is where we're at. This is this is our line in the sand. We would love to do this project. We're we're already we've already fallen in love with it, but we can't do it for less. You know, we, this is where we're at. Mm. And I held my breath when I said it, and I hit the send button. <laughs> and I read it twenty times to Beth, like you think this is okay? <laughs> it's okay. And then I hit the send. And what? Twenty four, forty eight hours later, we got a fine. That's fine. 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 Right. And I was like, "Wow!" If I had could have taught my younger self that to not get bullied in the negotiation process, mm. be okay with saying. And sometimes when contracts get so complicated, like it's. That can be a form of bullying in itself. Yeah, almost, no, it's just I, I of, want you to tweak this for this. You have this. to say, this is how we do it. This is, we deliver a really high level of service. You and get, this is what we feel comfortable. This is where this we is, are. Yeah. This is the best we can do. And you will get this and more. Like, we really sort of, I think Beth and I both really sort of go to the ends for our clients. Like, mm. She just recently... A client was going away. I mean, she just, what, how you move them and organize them. And it was way beyond just the furniture we purchased. It was really everything personal. Yeah. They just wanted to go on holiday and come back and, ha and show up with their, in, you know, leave one house, pull the door shut and walk into the next house and have it be seamless. <laughs> and she made it happen. Mm. 
Well, this is this is really interesting, actually. Like, how do you define service? <laughs> like what are, what it's really difficult. And, and, I think and, when and, people ask you to do things, you you want to say yes. yes. Yeah. And and you want clients to be happy. You obviously want clients yeah. to be really happy. Um, I think it's really difficult. I think so, you have to you have to say this is what I can do, and this and you have to be okay with charging for the service. Yeah. And say right, I we will do this, but this is what the rate will be. It's not part and parcel of the design. It's not pattern. something we normally do. It's not something we normally do. We can do it. We will charge for it. Um, and I've done it with clients even down to tabletop where we've done lookbooks for them, like a fashion lookbook, like, you know, different meals so they know how to set their table or housekeeper manuals so they know how to care for their house. And make the bed. And, um, and we like to give care manuals at the end end of the project because it also means that if it's not cared for correctly they've been given the they can't say they weren't given the proper instructions right yeah and do you follow up post like post occupancy kind of yeah i mean we pretty much well you've been lucky enough that that's we tend to do more than one thing for someone so so you are you're naturally in there we're naturally then back into their homes and but even, Which is lovely. even when I'm, like, even when there's long stretches, sometimes I'll just be out and I'll see something and I'll think, oh, you know, so-and-so would really like that. Mm. And I'll just take a photo on my phone and send them either a WhatsApp or an email saying, just saw this, thinking of you. And it's nice to always sort of put yourself kind of, or, you know, even if you, even if, um, you finished a project for a client. I always think I like to give uh, coffee table books. Sometimes you just send it at the end of the year, mm. even if it's about a topic that you think they like. They were at Christmas. You know, even do, if you're not they? working on a project that year, it's just nice to um, make a gesture. Yeah. Um, and you're quite intensely part of a client's life for that period of time. So I always think when it's over. It's a weird relationship. It's, yeah, you're so intensely. You're like literally. You speak to them all the time, every day, like WhatsApp, email, FaceTime. You're in their and bathroom. Then, <laughs> their bed, yeah. And then as soon as the house yeah, it's a very, it's, very, like, it's a very intimate, oh, up close now it's done. relationship. You are seeing, you know. You, and just, you see them all the time. And you're designing for, you know, a family, for a couple. You you, you hear their stories. You hear well, when, you know the their disagreements. And you know everything. You also know their habits like. Some people, you know, I've, we've had clients that insist upon certain types of mag, you know, magazine racks in the loo with a TV, yeah. or this is what I need in my bedside table drawer, and you're like, oh, really? Do I have to know that? <laughs> but you hear kind of everything, and these and, are the sorts of mirrors I'd like in my bathroom, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you're just like, okay, right, this is so normal, but you know. You know, it's you're you're making a very special, and maybe that's why doing commercial is sort of like a nice break from some residential things because you don't get those no. mm. kind of. Um, do you do you still give that same level of personalized service when you're working with a commercial client? Completely, or, yeah. And how how do you achieve that? We had a client recently. Um, this was so interesting. Didn't you think that the airport experience was yes. okay. fascinating? I mean, yes. It's so <laughs> fascinating. So we had a client, very, very busy global person, and uh, we had a meeting. Very short for time. In Always all, short. All, in all the odds. So we were going to have the meeting in the offices in town, and then his plans changed. We got him for a few minutes, didn't we? And then, and then he had to go, mm. and they... We spoke to his executive assistant and they said, well, would you be able to meet him out at this airport with a private hangar in this conference room? So we packed up the yeah. duffel bags. Yeah. <laughs> we we went, had these huge, because we don't get to see him very often, so we had these huge, great big samples of every single thing. Like big scale stuff, because people need to see big scale samples. Yeah. Big rug samples, big floor samples, big curtains. Huge, great big pieces of wood. <laughs> and we set up in this conference room at this private hangar. 
We saw the plane land. He got off. He came in. We had like 10 minutes. Yeah. We had to move so fast through that whole presentation. Straight around. Straight around the room. He said, great, thanks, out the door. So, I mean, it took us forever to prepare for it. and uh, Forever to get it there, forever to pack it up. But his, <laughs> we were with him for 10, 10 very productive minutes. Amazing. And so I'm interested as well, how you work with architects, because a lot of our listeners on this program are architects. They're running architectural studios. How do you find, what's your experience like of working with architects? When does it work? When does it not work? I think... And you can be totally honest. Okay, totally honest. <laughs> I think that um, it works best when you both stick to your knitting. I don't, we don't presume to be architects. And we would never try and spec anything architect, architectural. Shake, turn the house up saying shake it, the stuff that falls, falls out we deal with. Right. Anything else. We're lovely to be asked, but we don't presume to be making those decisions. And conversely, I think too many architectural practices think they also are, are interior design practices. Mm. And really what they want is they want their architecture to sing. And to, yeah, to shine and be sort of the only thing in the photo. Yeah. So an architect's can be very like, you know, heavy on material and like Exactly. The, so they the, don't want very much furniture. Yeah, there's furniture an clutter. You know, as far as they can see, furniture messes up the look the of the architecture. architecture. And the best products have been when there's an equal sort of an equal dialogue between mm. the two practices and you start together undefined roles i think like right. what you were saying like the this is your bit this is right and how, how do you define the roles because that that is you know that's a very interesting Not dynamic and i know architects who you know i know what i know what we like and architects like to think that we can do absolutely everything and you know we're the lead designers and everything should be how how do you create a good working relationship both being there at the beginning. You both are there at the beginning. <laughs> Instead of being added after the architect's been working on it for months and months and months. Right. And then you come in and they feel... Like you're trying to... Like you're trying to... Yeah, distract exactly. what they're doing. If you're both there at the beginning, I think it's much, much easier. And I also think it's very nice and important that when you are doing the mood boards, you... Once the client has had a chance to do their editing of it. They also then goes to the architect so they can sort of see what you're thinking. You know, the architect should see the CGIs, they should see the mood boards. Yeah, they should always try and keep everyone. They should get a copy of the fabric books because... If they really had a problem with one thing, or then they'd be able to say... What they like or what they don't like. And... That's when you get sort of the nice, or they might say, you know what, I know you're thinking about using this material, but we've used this on another project. Do you want to consider it? And it's a lovely um, and we dialogue. Have a couple of times, yeah. we, with stone and hardware in particular. Yes. Where an architect has been able to, we love some hardware. And it's nice to be able to share your resources. Yeah. And then you can talk about the color of the wood or the, the stone, like everyone is... In it together. Yeah, it's you, a, it becomes a creative team yes. as opposed to... Instead of one of you against the other. It's yeah, it's a, it nice has to be... to be together. It's a team. Great projects are because the team is great. That's, Brilliant. You know. So what's, what's next for you guys? Um, We're in the middle of an office. And then starting um, a ground-up house. Yeah. And then we're doing... Um, Fantastic, that's, that's exciting. Yeah. Mm. And then so complete, complete new build. Yeah. They're Which is always exciting. They, they just had planning, except we're going through all the sort of internal drawings at the moment. And that's an exciting one because it's in a different part. Um, a yeah, different part of America. We've never I, done anything. Never, and so the architecture is very different. It's down south. It has a different vibe. It has... Um, 
We've never done a house with so many porches. You know, <laughs> so it's much a, outdoor furniture. It's a lot of outdoor furniture, very much a porch culture. Right. Um, and then we're doing, uh, we're, we're starting on a Fifth Avenue apartment, so I feel very fancy. <laughs> um, that's exciting. Every I get excited at the beginning of every project. You know, it's, it's you know, where, where will we go? And then, you know, and then when you get to the end and you walk in and it's done and you're like, yeah, we did it. We nailed it. Like the Mayfair office. Every time I walk in that office, I think, right, we, we nailed it. You know, it I just, felt like that when we went back to Spain, actually. Yeah. You know, it's, it's very satisfying when you look at sort of what... And, and when Beth and I worked together, we were like literally side by side at the, la- at the computer, sort of brainstorming yeah. it out. And flicking through different websites and just talking about... And seeing what them. works. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and then who knows where the next one is after that, but... Brilliant. You know. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Oh, pleasure. Uh, that really, really fascinating insight into how you work, how you build well, relationships. Nice way to spend an afternoon. No, absolutely <laughs> lovely. Thank you. Pleasure. And that's a wrap. Thank you very much for listening. And of course, don't forget to book your one-to-one breakthrough session with the Architects Marketing Institute. This could be one of the most important conversations that you have around your business this year. So follow the link in the information and grab that opportunity. And I look forward to hearing all about it. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.